Picking up where we left off from last time, um, we're going to uh, move on from TLBs into demand paging. And uh, if you remember though, just to keep you uh, apprised of where we're going here, we talked about caching when applied to actual address translation. And um, in that case, uh, virtual address comes out of the CPU and the TLB is a type of cache. And uh, that cache in this particular case says, well, do I know about that virtual address? And if the answer is yes, then we get a very quickly get a physical address that we can go to physical memory with and uh, get the data. On the other hand, if things aren't cached, we have to go through a translation process uh, with the MMU, which involves often a table walk uh, through multiple levels of the page table. And then finally, uh, when we get that result, we can bring it back to the TLB. And uh, at that point, we have a physical address and the TLB will cache it for future access of that particular page. Uh, and then there's often an untranslated uh, path for the kernel. The question is really one of page locality, which is, uh, does it actually exist? And uh, because if we don't have locality, then it doesn't uh, matter that the TLB is a type of cache and is much faster when things are cached. If there's no locality, uh, we basically don't get any benefit. And we kind of talked about the fact that instruction ex uh, accesses have uh, definite locality to them as to stack accesses and some data accesses. So this can be good. And then also the TLB can be a multi-level cache as well. Uh, there was an interesting question uh, that came up uh, on Piazza after last time, which was, well, what's the, you know, why do we have both a TLB and a cache? And the answer in this case is that uh, basically the, the TLB is caching the address translation, whereas the actual cache is potentially caching the, the data from physical memory. Okay, so um, I just wanted to point out, we, uh, here's a modern chip and the TLB is uh, very important. So there's a TLB here uh, next to the cache uh, for data. There's a TLB next to the cache for instructions and there's actually a second level set of translations to uh, uh, provide us with some additional performance to avoid having to walk the page table unless absolutely necessary. Okay, so. Now, um, very quickly walking things through to show how this all worked. We last time showed you if we have a virtual address that happens to be a two level uh, page table, then we grab some bits from the virtual address, uh, look them up in the first level of the page table, that gives us the second level page table, uh, potentially this one, we look the, use the second say 10 bits in this uh, 10, 10, 12 example to look up an entry, and then finally, that gives us a physical page. So we started with this uh, red block here, which might be 20 bits uh, in one instance. That's a virtual page ID that gives us a physical page ID, which is also 20 bits. We copy, copy the offset and uh, suddenly we have our physical address. That physical page points to uh, a 4K chunk in memory. That's what it's doing. And this is DRAM over here. And the offset points to uh, a point, uh, an actual place within that page, okay? Um, and then just to pull it all together, uh, obviously here we walk the page table. Um, for potentially now uh, our TLB might actually have this cached. And so the way that works is we take this virtual uh, page, which is uh, 20 bits, we look it up in the TLB, that gives us our physical page. And so that's a much faster path and this TLB is uh, on chip and very close. And then finally, just to pull the uh, cache for the data back into play, uh, you know, this is basically, we can treat this physical address as a tag plus index plus byte offset. That index looks up in the cache, the tag gets compared, and if that matches, the byte then picks up a byte out of the regular cache rather than having to go to DRAM. All right, so that's everything in one little animated slide. Um, I was wondering if there were any questions on that or shall we keep going? We good? Now, actually, I had a question about um, this. the the physical page number can allow the physical address to be larger than 32 bits. Is that right? It could, depending on how you've set up your architecture. So if uh, if it's an architecture that can deal with more than, uh, say, 20 bits worth of 4K pages, then potentially this could be bigger. Um, there were some uh, intermediate architectures which were kind of halfway uh, in the x86 between 32-bit and 64-bit architectures 
where there was the potential to have a uh, somewhat larger physical address than virtual address. Uh, pretty much now that uh, it's a little bit of an anomaly, pretty much now um, the physical address has the same number of potential bits as the virtual address. But uh, as you say, that's possible. Okay, so, um, and if that were to come up in an exam for some reason, uh, you know, just see what the bits are that we tell you we have. So, uh, and then we kind of ended up with this um, at the end, uh, which was that uh, we said, well, in a good circumstance, the, say the instruction address comes out as a virtual address, we look it up and it's in the page table. So we immediately um, then get a translation, or excuse me, it's in the TLB, we get a quick translation, we look in the page table. And under that uh, circumstance, the, uh, the page is marked as uh, present. And so what's good about that is that now uh, the page uh, number is uh, basically picks a um, place in that page in physical memory and we can go ahead and complete the access. Now, if this uh, page table entry marks it as not present, then uh, we get a different uh, result. The instruction goes to the TLB. That TLB might or might not be cached, uh, but in that case, again, we look things up in the page table. So if it's cached, we know immediately uh, what the page table entry was. Otherwise, we have to go to the physical page table. In either case, the thing's marked as not present, and we get a page fault, and that causes an exception. And so that process now is, is stalled because we have an exception. Um, and uh, because we're potentially going to have to resolve this by going to disk, under those circumstances, we are going to put the process to sleep and pick another thing off the run queue. Uh, the page fault handler itself, uh, prior to that, potentially schedules uh, the disk to load something off of disk. Uh, later, that will potentially actually come off of disk. You remember our number of a, a million instructions worth of time might come off of the disk into physical DRAM. The page fault handler at that point starts running again, potentially um, putting a valid entry into the page table uh, and putting uh, our task, our process uh, back on the scheduler, which eventually wakes up. The instruction gets retried and uh, the page table entry is now valid and we go forward. So what I've just shown you here is the example of a page fault leading to pulling data off of disk, putting it in memory, cleaning up the page table, and then doing the access afterwards. So this is actually a, a good example of um, demand paging. So uh, in some sense, you can view this DRAM here is a cache on the disk, which is potentially much bigger than the DRAM. Okay, and so now this is a new kind of cache. Okay, there are caches everywhere. And so if you look at our uh, typical caching uh, diagram here where we have fast things at the left and big things at the right, and the whole point of caching is, well, the point of caching is as fast as the small things and, apparent, and as big as the big things uh, so that, for instance, the disk is going to appear to be uh, faster because we're caching things in DRAM. And so um, potentially, if you need a lot of physical memory, say more than what can fit in the DRAM, instead, we're going to put it all on disk and we're going to hope that our caching mechanism properly uh, puts the things that are in use in the DRAM. And if we could do that, namely get locality out of it, then we can run processes that have a much larger address space potentially than uh, will fit in physical DRAM, uh, but will fit on disk. And um, so, uh, basically, this is often the 90-10 rule. Programs spend about 90% of their time and 10% of their code, and it's pretty wasteful to waste DRAM just holding things that aren't used very often. And uh, a great example, if you're wondering why that might happen, is you have a huge uh, library that you've linked with, and only some of the code is actually in use by you uh, most of the time. That's one instance, and so most of the binary is left on disk. The second good example of this might be um, that your program goes through phases, and while well, it's doing one phase, uh, the other phase of the code and data is not in use. And so this is really caching, just like we talked about, for instance, here, where the SRAM might be a cache or there's an on-chip cache. These are caches on DRAM. In that instance, we try to put only the things that we're actively using from the DRAM into the cache and get performance out of that. Okay. Uh, 
So we're, we're now talking about caching from disk to DRAM. And so the solution of this type of cache is using memory here, DRAM as a cache on disk. And so um, what we talk about, uh, just to give you a little bit of a, um, how the ambiguities of terminology show up, we often talk about caching. If you don't have anything else to know about what we mean, we're often talking about DRAM being cached in SRAM. Uh, if you're being more specific and you're, ta and you're talking about paging, um, this is a type of caching where we're caching the disk uh, image, which is big in DRAM. It's still a type of caching, but uh, if you use, often you use the word paging to represent that. And today's lecture, uh, as we get on in, uh, toward the end there, we're going to start talking about a bunch of different mechanisms to try to do a good job of picking which of the blocks on disk actually go into DRAM. All right. And, um, and one thing just to, to know is, uh, for example, the clock algorithm, which we'll talk about, is a very common way of doing this. All right. Any questions on that? So now, if you look, uh, so demand paging is caching. You can really ask. All of the cache questions we talked about, and we started this last time, so what's the block size of this cache? Well, in this case, it's one page because the thing we bring from the disk into the DRAM is a page at a time. When we were talking about uh, caching from DRAM into, into the um, fast cache on chip, we were talking about a cache line, which was typically 32 to 128 bytes. So here, are the block size is, 48, is four kilobytes, excuse me, the organization, in this case, is, uh, is it direct mapped? Is it set associative? Is it fully associative? It's going to turn out that it's actually fully associative. And the reason for that is because through the page table, we can essentially map any uh, virtual address to any physical address using the page table in the TLB. And so we end up with a fully associative mapping there. Um, how do you locate a page? Well, you first check in the TLB, and if you can't find it, then you walk through the page table to find uh, the page in the physical DRAM. Uh, what's the page replacement policy? Uh, so when, we, when our DRAM is full and we need to pull a new page off the disk, which one do we throw out that was already there? And uh, you could ask, uh, you know, what are some options? Well, we talked about LRU and random last time for caches. This gets much more interesting, okay? Uh, there are many page replacement policies we could come up with, uh, and it's gonna really matter to us here because when you do a cache miss, and I do that uh, in quotes, a page table miss, you gotta go to disk, and that's our good old uh, a million instructions worth of time. So it's really gotta be really careful not to throw out the wrong block off of the disk. So, um, so what happens on a miss? Well, we uh, go to the disk. And, um, and then finally, what happens on a write? So remember, if you remember, when we were talking about hardware caches, we could write through or write back, where write through was the write goes not only into the cache, but into the underlying uh, backing store. If you think about it, we absolutely don't want write through in this instance, because that would mean the pro every processor write would not only go into DRAM, but then it would have to be written back to disk. And so now suddenly, our processor writes would be uh, a million times slower than they should be uh, because everyone had to go to disk. And so this is a write back cache. Uh, what is our, can anybody tell me what the, um, the consequences are of having to have a write back cache here? Yeah, great, dirty data in the cache. That's exactly right. So if there's dirty data in the cache, that means that before we replace something, we, we really have to write it back to disk because otherwise we lose data. So great, good answer. So this is an illusion of infinite memory, right? So in the case of a 32-bit processor, we remember that two to the 32 is four gigabytes. We would like the illusion of having four gigabytes in that instance without necessarily having four gigabytes, okay? And the way we do that is this virtual address space of four gigabytes is squashed down through the page table to the physical memory, which might be a lot less. So I'm showing you here a small, what would be a small machine by today's standards, but let's suppose that my, it's 32-bit address space, so we have four gigabytes, and uh, we have um, only 512 megabytes of physical DRAM. What happens is 
we use the page table to map parts of our virtual address space to things that are actually in memory, and the things that aren't actually in memory get mapped to disk. Okay, and so we know that to have a four gigabyte virtual me memory space that's all in use, we need to have four gigabytes on the disk. This may not be a big deal. You know, today we've got terabytes without problem, um, but we couldn't fit that whole, four, that whole four gigabytes into our physical memory. And so that's what our page table does. And so the disk is larger than the physical memory. This has uh, pretty much always been the case. Um, and uh, so by uh, basically using the disk as our actual uh, memory we're referencing, but then caching it in physical memory, we get the illusion that we have much more physical memory than we, than we want. Um, and also I, I will point out that this is only one virtual address space. So if we have uh, you know, 20 processes, each of them might have four gigabyte virtual memory space, we can multiplex them through their page tables so that each of them might have four gigabytes on disk but together they don't fill up more than the 512 megabytes that's uh, physically available. And that's kind of uh, how we get this multiplication effect. We get to have uh, much more, the apparent uh, increase of our physical memory by a significant fraction. And so the principle here is really a transparent level of indirection. That's that um, when we're using this virtual memory, the processor doesn't have to know that it's virtual and uh, transparently all of its uh, accesses get translated through the TLB to uh, if it's actually in physical memory, then we get very fast access, okay? And if it's not actually in physical memory, then we do page faults. We have to pull things into physical memory, possibly throwing something else out of physical memory, adjusting all the page tables. But we do that transparently to the program, the operating system. This is its job uh, in the case of paging. And it, um, the page table lets us basically pay, place portions of the address space anywhere in physical memory. And as a result, um, it's very flexible how we decide to use this physical memory amongst the set of processes that are there. Okay, are there any questions on that? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, are we good? Now, uh, and feel free, by the way, to use the, the chat. I am actually watching the chat. So uh, if you have any questions, um, I will restate them. Um, so now let's uh, remember for a moment, we talked about a page table entry. This is in fact the x86 page table entry for 32-bit machines. Um, it had this 20-bit physical page frame number. Remember, we've talked about 20 bits in that example I uh, re reminded you of at the beginning of the lecture. And then the remaining 12 bits uh, are basically uh, consumed by a bunch of different bits that give us uh, different status bits and so on. Three of them are free for the OS to use in any way it wants. Um, several of them, uh, for instance, may be forced to zero because by uh, um, reserving, being reserved for later. The most important ones I want to talk about for now are the present bit and the dirty bit. Okay, so the present bit, which is the same as valid in pretty much other architectures, says that the uh, virtual address that, ma that is uh, going through this page table entry has uh, actually a mapping or not. And if P here, this lowest bit, is not a one, if it's a zero, then the rest of the 31 uh, bits, including the page frame number, are basically uh, meaningless and are free for the operating system to do anything they want. On the other hand, if this present bit is a one, then the rest of the bits are meaningful, including uh, the page frame number. And we know that at that point, we have a translation. The other bit uh, we haven't talked about yet is the dirty bit. And uh, it's exactly what you think it is. It basically keeps track for valid or present pages, it keeps track of the fact that that page has been written recently, okay? And so this is the way that the operating system knows that if it's gonna free up a physical page and uh, reuse it for somebody else, it's, it can't just throw it out. It's gotta actually write it back to disk first in order to uh, preserve that data. And so that dirty bit is hardware managed, okay? In this case, D is something that um, 
it, it happens automatically when you do a write or a store operation to a page that's already uh, mapped into DRAM, uh, and this, uh, this DBIT gets set by the hardware for you. Okay. Now, uh, let's look at some demand paging mechanisms. So first of all, um, I talked a little bit about uh, the fact that um, the page table entry makes demand paging implementable. Uh, so valid, um, okay, hold on, uh, I'll answer that question in a second. Well, actually, maybe I'll answer the question. So the question was, does the implementation for having a disk page file itself introduce much overhead? Um, so the, uh, you're talking about the overhead of this overall arrangement where some of the, um, the data is on disk and some of it's in physical memory, is that the question? Oh, so the question was, um, does this, this arrangement introduce overhead in the instance where we don't actually have to uh, go uh, out to disk? And the answer is no, this translation of the TLB uh, and so on is put into the pipeline in a way that doesn't impede fast access, okay? So, uh, so if you didn't need the illusion of infinite memory, um, but did something else, then you could design a processor uh, perhaps without virtual memory. But if you have a processor that's already been designed for virtual memory, part of designing the pipeline for that is figuring out how to have the TLB access work uh, at full speed of the pipeline. So that's part of what a computer architect has to figure out how to do. Now, if you're thrashing in the TLB because it's too small and you're constantly missing in the TLB and going back to the page table, that can have some overhead. All right, good. Now, uh, good question. So, um, so basically the difference between valid and not valid is whether that page table entry uh, represents a page that's actually mapped to DRAM. Um, but suppose the user references a page with an invalid page table entry. So let's actually start to think about that. Now, if you remember in that brief animation I gave you a few slides ago, we're obviously gonna get a page fault at that point. So the memory management unit traps to the operating system calling, causing a page fault, and now it's up to the operating system to decide what to do. And I will tell you off the bat here that, uh, you know, once you've trapped into the operating system, uh, it's not always the case that uh, there is a valid page out on disk. It's possible that this is really a part of the address space that the user wasn't supposed to use. Uh, in which case you're going to get a, a page fault or a segmentation fault core dump out of it. Uh, it could be that the reason we've marked this as uh, not present is to be a flag to uh, catch uh, some condition, in which case maybe we uh, return immediately without changing this. And so you could actually have parts of the address space whose uh, sole purpose is when you read or write from an address, you actually trap into the operating system to do something. So um, there are many interesting things you can do. Another one, by the way, I'll just toss out for you, is that uh, this, this W bit, if we mark something as not writable, we might do that, uh, as we mentioned before, right after a fork where we've copied the uh, page tables and pointed both the parent and the child at the same physical uh, pages, but marked them all uh, read only. That's the mechanism with a page fault that you could uh, do copy on write. We mentioned that before. Uh, so memory mapped I.O., um, the question is, is this the way memory mapped I.O. works? In many cases, uh, what actually happens with memory mapped I.O. is it doesn't even go through the regular page table. There are certain addresses that are known to go directly to, um, uh, not to the page table, but go directly out to the device. Uh, in other cases, uh, you can have uh, these parts of the page table marked to uh, ignore the cache and write through if it's part of the address space that's covered by the page table. So these are a little different depending on circumstances. We'll talk more about memory mapped IO in a couple of lectures. Um, so uh, we get a page fault. What does the OS do on a page fault? Well, um, assuming for a moment that we're actually doing demand paging, uh, we have to pick an old page to throw out. So let's assume for a moment that all of the DRAM is in use and the fact that we just had to pull something in off of the disk um, means that uh, 
we, we have to get rid of something else. So we pick an old page to replace. If the old page is modified, namely the D is one, then we have to write the contents back to disk so we don't lose any data. Um, and then, and, and listen carefully on this, we mark its page table entry as invalid because the previous page that we're removing, it's no longer accessible because we put it out on disk. Uh, and any cached TLB has to be also marked as invalid uh, because if it isn't, then the processor could try to access this old page and the TLB would say, oh, here it is, and uh, we would get bad translation. Okay. So um, the, the uh, question is, how would virtual addressing work without demand paging? The answer uh, is, uh, if you're trying to do demand paging, virtual addressing wouldn't work without demand paging. Um, so you would be pulling things off of the disk. But you can also use, uh, like I said, you can use the virtual addresses to do uh, copy on write for fork, even if you're not demand paging things off the disk. Um, so maybe that uh, is one uh, answer to that question. And um, the other question is, uh, can you briefly explain how the correct page on disk is identified? Hold that question, I'll tell you in a second. Um, that's totally up to the operating system as to where it wants to store that information. Could be a page table, et cetera. Uh, it could be uh, in the page table somewhere, or it could be using those 31 bits. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, at that point, we load the new page. So we're back here, by the way, to a page fault. Uh, we load the new page into memory from disk, and um, we have to update the page table entry for that new page to now be valid, because we pulled it in off the disk and we've map updated its mapping. and this is uh, a little confusing usually to people. We have to invalidate the TLB entry for that page, which probably indicates that it's invalid. So if you remember, how did we get into this whole process? We uh, referenced a page with an invalid PTE. That invalid PTE probably got loaded into the page table. And so we have to get rid of it out of the TLB. It was loaded into the TLB. We have to get rid of it out of the TLB so that um, the moment we try to restart and update this page table, it won't find anything in the TLB. It'll have to go uh, down to the page table, come back with uh, updated TLB. And at that point, we just continue where we left off. And this is the cache. So if you say demand paging is caching, this little thing I have, uh, this box that I've highlighted is what makes it like a cache, okay? Um, and what's interesting is once we restart, the TLB for the new page is going to be, uh, have to be reloaded because we'll have a TLB, uh, missing TLB, uh, have to go down to the page table, we'll reload the uh, page table entry, which is now valid, and we get to continue where we left off. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, while we're waiting, so notice uh, this load new page into memory from disk, that little line there is potentially a million instructions worth of time. So while we're waiting, uh, we hopefully have put this process properly on a wait queue so that some other process can run until the data comes back. All right, questions? Okay, so uh, good. So back here, so you're t we're, uh, the question is, so why do I do this invalidation for the new entry? All right. So the answer is, think about the TLB as a cache on the page table. Okay, so what happened was up here at the beginning, we referenced the page and we got a page fault because we looked at the page table entry, it said invalid. But if you think about what happened in that process, we took the invalid entry uh, from the page table and put it into the TLB. And so now we have a cached uh, page table entry that says invalid. And so if we don't invalidate that cached entry in the TLB, then when we restart the process down here and uh, go to look at that page, it's still gonna be invalid because the TLB entry still says invalid. So the first thing, so what we do is we invalidate that entry. We kill, uh, we kill it out of the TLB so that when we restart the instruction, we have to go all the way down to the page table, reload the TLB with the page table entry that now says valid. Did that help? Great. I, and I understand that's confusing. It always is uh, the first time you see it. But it, what's the key thing is to think of the TLB as 
uh, a cache on the page table and it would have the old page table entries in it, which uh, have become invalid or incorrect because we're messing with the page table itself. We're changing it. All right, are we good? Everybody else good on that? All right, good. So the original origins of paging were pretty much what I said before, which is you had way too little memory uh, for all of the processes you were trying to run. So you had many clients running on dumb terminals. This might be a mainframe. There's lots of processes, but they're all out on disk because our memory is very small. And so paging was really necessary to do anything. All right, now today you go to buy a machine. I know when I buy machines, you know, if I don't buy them with 16 gigabytes, I'm kind of wondering what I'm thinking because programs require a lot of memory these days. Um, so it's less the case that we have huge processes that need to be multiplexed, but there are still, you know, there's still pretty big uh, parts of libraries that aren't in use. So there are some uses of paging, but it's less, it's less necessary than it was originally. Um, so disks provide most of the storage. We have a little tiny memory, uh, and this was kind of where things started. Now, if you uh, move forward, and by the way, we're actively swapping back and forth a lot. So paging happened a lot. Now, paging, of course, if it's a million uh, instructions worth of time and you're paging a lot, you can imagine that nobody's making any good progress. All of our uh, processes are, are hurting for performance, and uh, this is just bad. So if you kind of look at the uh, modern recommendations for Linux and Windows and Mac OS and so on, they're uh, recommending that you have enough DRAM so that paging very rarely happens. It's something that kind of happens to readjust and mostly be, uh, to readjust what's on disk and what's in memory, but most of the time uh, we have tremendous locality and as a cache, this is you know 99% hit rate because the moment you go out, you're in trouble. So uh, today's very different situation. We have these huge computers and even our local machines are huge. And so uh, if you look at a single machine, for instance, and you guys should all you know, occasionally look at your task manager or PSAUX or whatever you wanna look at, what you see is that memory is about 75% used, not 100%. 25% is in use for dynamics, if you were to stare at some of this. And what's interesting here uh, to me is that uh, 1.9 gigabytes of our memory, of, of our 16 gigabytes roughly, 15.5 uh, that's uh, usable uh, to processes is shared. So that means there's a whole bunch of sharing going on between processes through memory. And that's, that's very different. Uh, first of all, gigabytes were unheard of back in the original paging days. But secondly, we've got a lot of sharing, both from libraries, from common communication and so on. And so, uh, yes, we have paging going on, demand paging in the traditional sense, but we have a lot more interesting use of sharing going on as well. Now, uh, many uses of virtual memory and demand paging today, and we've told you several of them. One, for instance, the stack, which is growing downward, has an empty, uh, page at the, uh, an invalid page kind of at the point where the stack is going to hit. And the moment that the stack grows down, um, you get a page fault, you allocate a new page and zero it. So this is an instance where the page fault isn't going to disk. In fact, what's doing is it's going and allocating a brand new uh, zero fill DRAM page and uh, adjusting the um, page table entry to point to that new page. Uh, extending the heap. Same idea. Uh, forking, we talked a lot about using page table entries marked as read only as a way to avoid copying. Uh, when you take a child, uh, when the child is, is uh, first constructed, you don't copy the actual data, you copy the page tables and mark them all as read only. Uh, exec, you're only bringing in parts of the binary that are in active use and you do this on demand. So that's a good example, et cetera, of using demand paging. Um, and, and memory mapping to get explicit shared regions or to access files. So virtual memory processes are actually, or virtual memory mechanisms, including uh, interesting uses of the page table entry uh, are used for lots of things these days. Now, uh, some administrivia. So, um, uh, you know, 
I realize it's very stressful for everybody. Um, I'm hoping that um, everybody's remaining safe. Uh, you know, obviously uh, washing your hands and good social distancing uh, to the extent possible is important. But um, also important is I want everybody there to stay in touch with people. Um, use your devices, talk to other people, you know, come up with, uh, you know, uh, Google Hangouts or whatever and talk because uh, it'd be very easy to get isolated now. I know I'm getting cabin fever uh, staring at my, uh, my screen. Um, so I imagine you guys are all kind of doing so as well. Uh, yeah, party over Zoom. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, except for class time. <laughs> so uh, we're intending to keep teaching CS162 virtually. So I want you to know that um, we want to keep feeding interesting information uh, to you guys. And um, so the lecture is going to stay live. Discussion sessions and office hours are live. Uh, we've made some adaptations that um, I outlined in a recent post. But um, for instance, we're only going to have one Friday section per time slot for now. Um, but uh, we're going to make sure that you guys can all attend office hours. We may adjust this as we see necessary. Um, I apologize for disruptions in office hours, including mine. Uh, hopefully this will stabilize. Um, and one change to sections is we're going to start recording some walkthroughs of the section material independent of the section itself so that then posting videos so that you can look at those. Okay. Um, we've relaxed some deadlines and added some slip days. So the Piazza Post uh, talks about what we did. Uh, we're making homework uh, eight and nine optional um, and moving the homework deadlines out and give you, giving you some more slip days uh, to help. I realize it's extremely stressful as you guys kind of transition from uh, dorms out to home and um, et cetera. And so uh, just let us know how it's going and make sure to stay in contact with your TAs and, and so on. Um, now, this uh, is a little more controversial than I thought, um, but uh, we moved midterm two to uh, the week after the week after spring break, really uh, hoping to uh, give people a little more time to get adjusted. Now, I understand that this is conflicting with physics uh, 7b. Um, so uh, we may need to tune this date a little bit more, but I'm intending to do it that week. And I think the question is really, um, and maybe I'll post this on Piazza, whether making it say Wednesday or something um, instead of Tuesday, I guess given things are virtual, we have a little more flexibility. So I'm gonna maybe do a little bit of a poll to try to figure out whether Tuesday or Wednesday is better um, and give you guys a little more flexibility. Uh, part of this is for us to figure out exactly uh, what the right way to do the midterms are. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, I'm, uh, we're just trying to, trying to help you guys get through this crazy transition period. I think the next two weeks are going to be very stressful. So, all right. Uh, I don't know if I have any more to say on this, but um, we want to keep six, CS 162 going. And uh, I see a lot of thank yous on the group chat. So you're welcome. Uh, let's, you know, I, I love this material, so I want to make sure you guys get a chance to still learn it, and I know you're working very hard, so. Um, ah, so the question is about the midterm being af after the pass, no pass deadline. That's an interesting question. Uh, I think it always was, though, wasn't it? Because it was midterm 10, uh, I think it's the 10 weeks into the term, uh, but maybe that counts as the previous one. All right. Uh, that's a good question. Well, uh, let's figure this out. Um, okay. Gotcha. Former date was before the deadline. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I guess a poll is in order. Okay. So let's move, uh, move on from this a little bit. Um, okay. So now moving on, um, for now, we'll, we'll figure this out a little bit more. I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, more of a um, graphic before we move on to some of the mechanisms for replacement policies. So in the old days, what happened when you loaded an executable into memory is basically the executable lived on disk, uh, contained code and data segments, OS loads into memory, and you pretty much load everything at once. Um, program sets up stack and heap, and uh, we run. 
But let's look at, with, uh, look at this in more detail when we add virtual address spaces into the picture. Um, so the virtual address space for a process is uh, this, in which the, um, you know, we have the kernel, and for now we're going to uh, keep this up, um, keep this up kind of uh, the kernel up in the address space. We're going to ignore the sort of meltdown questions for now. Um, and we have sort of the stack growing down and the heat growing up and data and code. And this is the virtual address space. On disk, again, we still have the executable with code and data and so on. And what happens is uh, the pages that we end up using uh, in the virtual address space are going to be backed on disk called the backing store. And typically, it's in an, an optimized block store. But um, you could think of this as a file. And in many operating systems, it is just a file. Um, so this is, uh, on disk, the backing store for the virtual image. So what does that really mean? That means that um, we take this virtual address space and all of its information. It's in the disk. It's on the disk somewhere. It's not necessarily physically in memory. Okay. And so the user page table maps the entire uh, virtual address space um, in one way or another, swapped into and out to of memory as needed. So uh, just to give you an example, here's the page table. And notice how the page table is mapping um, some of the entries from the virtual address space into physical uh, parts on the disk, or excuse me, physical parts in memory. So these pages are actually in memory, as is the page table itself, because remember, the page table can uh, be paged out. All right, But uh, what else? Well. The things of the virtual address space that are not in memory have to be somewhere else. Okay, so the resident pages map to memory frames. Everything else, the OS records where to find them. So if you think about this for a moment, abstractly, we have all of these page table entries which are marked as invalid because they don't map to physical memory, and they point somehow at the stack and at the heap and at the data that's not in use. Okay, so these are all back pointers. Now, there was a good question earlier, uh, how, how does that happen? I mean, how do you do this mapping? And there's many ways to do it, uh, and uh, anything you can think of has probably been done. Some simple ways, of course, are the, there's 31 free bits in the page table once things are invalid. So you could use those 31 bits to indicate uh, where things are in the swap uh, drive or the swap file. Um, the other thing you could do is, in fact, you could have a mirror of your virtual address space in a data structure, like a, ha a hash table or something in the kernel that also maps virtual address to where it is on disk. So you're, you, uh, you're all very clever and would have many ways that you could come up with of doing that mapping. But this is up to the operating system, and it's entirely done in software. So the hardware doesn't have to worry about, uh, for pages that are invalid, where are they? That's up to the operating system. Okay, and so for instance, in uh, typical Linux, uh, there's like a find block uh, where you give it a process ID and a page number, and it'll tell you which disk block it goes to. Okay, and some op operating systems have spare space in the PTE to use it. Some uh, purely in software as hash tables. And um, I guess I said all this already in the previous slide. Okay, um, and you usually want a backing store for the resident pages too. What do I mean by that? So that even though these pages are in memory, you probably have a space for them on disk. OK, and why is that? Well, because, um, well, if they're read only, uh, you can just throw them out without having to worry about putting them somewhere. And if they're dirty, uh, when you write them back to disk, there's a well-defined place for it. So usually, this whole address space uh, of all of the active pages has a place on disk. So, um, and you may map code segment directly to the on-disk image, and this saves a copy to the swap file. So let me show you this, and you can share that. So for instance, here's an interesting thing where we have process one has some code, which notice, by the way, now these code frames I have is a, a cyan color here. And the code is on disk, OK? And so basically, um, things that aren't in memory are just mapped back to the disk itself. We don't have to somehow map them to uh, a separate copy, okay, uh, separate from the binary. And then here's process number two, 
And the fact that it shares the same code means that really we only have to find space on disk for the things that are unique about process two, like its stack, heap, and data, but not the code. And so um, in that instance here, if you notice the code maps back to the same code segment. And so in the page table, the code that can actually map to the same physical page frame between these two processes. So this is a pretty good use of shared, um, shared mapping, okay? And this is used for uh, binaries that are launched in more than one process. If you're running the same uh, program multiple times, it's also very good for shared libraries, et cetera. All right. Um, now, last thing I wanted to point out, by the way, so this is the, um, the page table uh, in memory as well. So um, one last thing is uh, an active, an interesting uh, aspect here is let's look at what happens with the page fault now that we've got this all laid out. Yeah, guys, can you hold the, that's a good question, if you could, or a good point, if you could hold the um, comments to the lecture for now. Um, let's, uh, we'll talk about this other option later. Um, if you look here at uh, process one is busy running, and if, notice what happens here if uh, we're trying to do a data access and we get a page fault. Now what? So what we've got here is this representation of who's actually using the processor. At this point, uh, we try to reference something in the page table, it's invalid. And so now what? Uh, well, this process can't run anymore. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start pulling that page off of the disk. At the same time, we're going to switch over to this other process, which can now run. Okay, and so once we've started this fetching, um, we've gone out to the device driver and it started a disk fetch and so on. We move our way over to this process and we're busy running. Later, when the, uh, the data comes back and uh, is put into memory, then at that point, we can uh, fix the page table entry up. We can restart the active process. It'll rerun that same instruction that was run before, and this time it will succeed and this process can go forward. Okay. Good. Questions? All right, now, uh, so the summary here is basically when we go to do a load, for instance, we try to reference it, we get a, uh, an invalid page table entry that traps into the kernel, the operating system decides what to do. For instance, it finds that there's a page to pull in, that page gets pulled into a free frame in memory. If there weren't a free frame in memory, we would have to sort of uh, write one back out to disk or, or find one. Uh, it, once it's finally in, then we can reset the page table to be valid and rerun uh, that load instruction and the second time it will succeed. Okay, so that's our basic uh, page fault handling. All right, so some questions we need to answer. So during a page fault, where does the operating system get a free frame from? Well, it keeps a free list. Okay, well, that's fine, but where does the free list come from? Well, Unix variants typically run some form of Reaper, which is if the memory gets too full, Schedule dirty pages to be written back to disk um, and uh, zero out clean pages which haven't been accessed in a while to help keep the free list free, uh, full. So that at the point that we actually get a page full, we can just go to the free list and grab a free page. Um, as a last resort, we may have to evict a dirty page first, and this gets a little tricky. Um, the question is sort of how do we build all these mechanisms? Uh, how do we organize them, and what's the replacement policy? Right, I'm kind of saying here that uh, we're running a Reaper to get rid of things, but what exactly do we do? And then how many page frames per process, okay? The question is sort of, as we're balancing between a lot of different processes, then what? Uh, process A gets you know, so much DRAM, process B gets so much DRAM, what's our organization process? Okay, and so the rest of the lecture, um, I'm gonna be talking about some of these mechanisms. So right now, oh, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, so thrashing is uh, when a process gets put, put to sleep to pull a page from disk and then the page gets evicted before the process gets to run again is the question, and that's correct. And we'll talk more about thrashing um, and, uh, in a little bit. But basically, if you're in a situation in which processes are constantly going to disk and not making any progress, um, that's called thrashing. And uh, that's a very bad scenario, and it's clearly a situation where you have too many processes running for the amount of memory, 
or that their working sets of all the processes when you add them up is more than the physical DRAM. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and the other question was, is an invalid page the same as a page that's unmapped? And uh, the answer would be yes to that. Okay, what's the difference between a page and a frame? In this instance, a page and a frame are the same thing. Those are different names. Uh, typically, um, the page is, is 4K, and uh, that's the size that we're um, moving through the system and, and registering with the page table entries. Uh, so this is a great place to break. Let's take about a, um, I don't know, four minute break and come back and we will continue where we left off. I'm gonna pause the recording and, uh, and I'll see you guys in just a moment. Okay, since we have a couple of questions here, I'll, I'll talk before we restart. So um, there is a little bit of more of a question about um, page versus frame. So uh, when you look at a disk and uh, other block device, typically there's something called a sector, which is the physical kind of minimum thing that you can read and write off of a disk. Uh, sectors are small. So typically they're um, in a lot of disks, they're like 512 bytes. The, that si sector size is really not particularly useful because the overhead of uh, doing things in 512 byte uh, chunks is just too high. And so things are combined together into 4K pages. So oftentimes the word page is what you pull on and off the disk, but it's not the physical minimum thing. It's the, um, it's the unit that the operating system has decided to pull on and off. Pages are also what uh, is the um, page table is optimized for. And so if you Notice all of our discussions with that page table entry that's 32 bits have been about uh, the fact that it's um, uh, optimized for 4K pages in that instance. Okay, now what, um, when people talk about frames moving in and out and pages moving in and out, those are oftentimes used interchangeably and are kind of, uh, I realize it gets a little confusing, uh, but, uh, I would say for most of the things we're talking about here, a frame and a page are pretty much the same. But the physical unit you're looking for there is a sector. All right, I don't know if that answered uh, that question. But um, I think let's continue with the lecture. Uh, so moving forward, um, we, uh, let's talk a little bit about this uh, using the memory as a cache. Okay, and so to do that, I wanna say a little bit about our working set model. So if you typically look over time and you look at the addresses that are in use, uh, what we have is address on the y-axis in time. What you see is that um, as the program executes, it sort of transitions through sequences of working sets, which are chunks of uh, addresses over time that are in use. And so as we transition through here, you'll see that in any given time, you could take a slice and you'd see that, well, this range of addresses and that range of addresses are in active use. And then maybe during this segment, only these uh, parts of the address are in active use and so on. Um, this segment is particularly, uh, I'm gonna say bad, and you'll see why in a moment, because look at all, most of the addresses are in use. So in cases where we have a small number of addresses, the working set, which is the set of things in active use, is small. When we have a lot of addresses in use, the working set's large. And what we want is we want the working set of the processes that are currently co-resident in the DRAM to uh, add up to something less than the total size of the DRAM. Otherwise, we're going to be thrashing. Okay. And so what's interesting here is you can talk about the uh, cache behavior under a working set model. And typically what happens is as you increase the cache size, more and more cache, of course the hit rate goes up because you can store more things in the cache. And what's interesting about this is because of this working set model, um, as you grow the cache, you're, allow, you're able to sort of um, absorb larger and larger working sets, but they sort of uh, happen in kind of chunks where it's like, well, a small cache is good here, and then when I have a slightly bigger cache, suddenly maybe I can do there. And when I have a really big cache, I can do that. And you get this stair-step kind of behavior and growth and hit rate as a result of uh, the cache size. Okay, and this is also true that as we put, uh, give more or less of the DRAM to different processes as cache, we can get different hit rates out of the different processes depending on what their working set model is like. 
okay? And we're transitioning from one working set to the next uh, will actually cause us to um, have some misses. Um, potentially, if we have a big enough cache, we could have two different working sets that are co-resident, okay? And, uh, you know, we can start worrying about capacity conflict and compulsory misses, all of the same things you've thought about before start coming into play, um, applicable to pretty much every cache. Uh, what's interesting, though, is there's another model, which is um, of locality, uh, which is the ZIPF model. And this is basically that the likelihood of accessing items of rank R is 1 over R to the A. So rank means this is the most popular item, the second one's the second most popular item, and so on. We sort by popularity. And then if we actually look at the hit rate uh, and we look at the popularity, what you see is this popularity is uh, what fraction of the uh, items of a given popularity are there. And the, um, the hit rate is a function of cash as we make the cash bigger so that it now can encompass more and more of the rank, we see what the hit rate does. So notice that the hit rate's over here. Uh, what's interesting about ZIP is that it's a very common uh, access pattern for uh, database accesses or website accesses over the internet. Um, but uh, what it really says is kind of that uh, it's very rare to access items below the top few, but there's a very long tail. Um, you get a substantial value from even a tiny cache because if you have a tiny cache, you suddenly get uh, a huge hit gain. Um, but uh, even though you have a fairly large cache, you still have a lot of hits because there's a lot of items that are out in the, um, in the tail here. And so uh, depending on your model of access, you can get completely different uh, behavior of hit rate as a function of, of cache size. Um, that much being said, uh, let's, let's think about demand paging uh, from a cost model standpoint. And again, we sort of have hit rate times hit rate time plus miss rate times miss time, or, and by the way, this is effective access time, eat, uh, or hit time plus miss rate times miss penalty. These two guys are the same idea. So we could say our memory access time is 200 nanoseconds. Our average page fault service time might be eight milliseconds. So this is looking at the disk. Notice the difference between uh, DRAM and disk is, is a significant difference. And the probability of a miss might be P, and one minus probability of a hit is uh, one minus P, or is the probability of a hit, excuse me. And so then we can say, well, the expected access time is 200 nanoseconds, that's our hit time, plus the probability of a miss times eight milliseconds. And uh, this is something to watch out for. You can't add nanoseconds and milliseconds directly. You actually have to scale to one unit or another. So I bring this out to nanoseconds. And now I can say sort of if one access out of 1,000 causes a page fault, then uh, you, you add this up and uh, you plug a um, one of one one thousandth into P and you get 8.2 microseconds for your average access time, which is a slowdown by a factor of 40. So look at this for a sec here, just by saying one out of a thousand is a miss. You know, that's a 99.9% .9 hit is a slowdown of 40. So this is why basically today's machines can't afford to ever page fault on a regular basis and pull things off of disk because you just kill performance. And so uh, if you're page faulting a lot, your processes are running very poorly and you need more DRAM. Uh, if you want a slowdown that's less than 10%, here's a good uh, execution or a, a good uh, exercise for you guys, then you can say, well, 200 nanoseconds times 1.1 is less than effective access time. You work it out, you find that you end up with one page fault in 400,000 is necessary to only have a 10% slowdown. So hopefully what you get out of this slide is page fault bad, uh, no page fault, a big DRAM good, right? <laughs> uh, so, um, keep that in mind. And again, this is just that disks are slow. They're physical beings. Now, what factors lead to misses in page cache? Well, just like in a regular cache, we have compulsory misses, which is the first time we've ever seen something. Uh, how much you get rid of them? Well, you could prefetch. So if you uh, have something uh, and you notice that basically uh, you're starting to read an item off of disk because you did a fault. Maybe you read the next couple of them, uh, hoping that there's some spatial locality. So rather than pulling just a single page in on a miss, maybe you prefetch a few pages. Or maybe you do something more complicated. This is like predicting the future in some way. 
but you know, we talked about that uh, a while back where we were talking about schedulers. So, um, you know, whatever way you can predict, maybe you only, you don't load just one page off the disk, you load multiple. Capacity misses is really a not enough memory. So this is a situation where you got to get more DRAM because uh, your working set sizes don't, you know, some of the working set doesn't fit in memory. Uh, increased DRAM, that's not a quick fix. Another option is, is surprisingly, if you've got too many processes in memory, maybe you ought to just stop a couple of them, page them out to disk, run the remaining ones to completion, and then pull the other ones back off disk. You're more likely to complete much faster than if you try to run them all at the same time. Uh, think that through. That might seem a little counterintuitive, but in fact, in this instance, thrashing is just such a bad thing that it's much better to uh, st send things out to disk and bring them back in than to try to run them all simultaneously. Conflict misses. Well, there aren't any. Why? We have a fully associative cache. Okay, so that's good. There's a new thing called policy misses. Okay, this is something that you don't really see when you talk about hardware caches, and a policy miss is uh, one in which pages were in memory before, so it's sounding a little bit like a conflict, but they got kicked out prematurely because you had a bad replacement policy. So if you had a replacement policy that was very poorly figuring out uh, which were important pages and it was just kicking them out, what could happen there is you uh, load a page into memory off of disk and then you go back to look for it and your replacement policy has kicked it out and you're uh, acting very slowly again. And so really policy is extremely important, the replacement policy. So how do you fix better replacement policy? Now, what are some page replacement policies? Well, why do we care about it? Well, replacement's an issue with any cache. It's particularly important with pages. Cost of being wrong is high, you gotta go to disk. Okay, we wanna keep important pages in memory. So let's talk about a few. So FIFO, first in, first out. You throw out the oldest page, you're fair, you let every page live in memory for the same amount of time. Um, seems good because it's simple, but in fact, it's just a bad idea. Because if you have a page that's used over and over and over again, look what happens with FIFO. It's used over and over and over again, and eventually it's old, even though it's still constantly in use, it gets thrown out. So FIFO has no adaptation for, for the way the pages are used, and as a result, you can imagine, it's just a bad idea as a replacement policy for pages in demand page. Another might be random. Pick a random page, throw it out. So this is the typical solution for the TLBs themselves, okay? Because the TLB at worst maybe has to do a page, uh, you know, go down to the page table and uh, fetch it, although you could try to do LRU with TLBs. It's easier to do random. But it's pretty unpredictable, and that unpredictability means that uh, it's still a bad idea, not as bad as FIFO, but it's still a bad idea because it has a tendency to throw out just by accident things that are still heavily used. Well, that doesn't seem great. So what else could we do? How about min? This is great. Here is, uh, let's replace the page that won't be used for the longest time in the future. Perfect. All right, so this is what we need, except uh, unfortunately you gotta know the future. Uh, and so min is gonna be a guaranteed not to exceed policy for us. Uh, it's provably optimal, but um, perhaps a way we can get toward min is the fact that the past is a good predictor of the future. Um, so the, uh, the answer for why uh, random is typical solution for TLBs is just that uh, it's not, it's hard to do LRU uh, in hardware for something that has to be as fast as uh, part of a pipeline cycle. And so um, if you've actually got your page table uh, properly cached, then um, you know, that page walk might not be too bad. And so using random uh, TLB replacement when you only have 120, when you have 128 or 256 bit, uh, 256 entries, uh, might be an okay policy and way to keep the TLB fast. Um, the other uh, thing I will point out is, as I showed you earlier in the lecture, typical TLBs that are really fast, uh, close to the processor pipeline, are backed up by a second level TLB, which might have a better replacement policy. Okay. So FIFO is bad. So the question is, can you explain again why FIFO is bad? 
And the point is, the heavy pages get in the cache. So let's suppose, uh, suppose you have a page that's used uh, over and over again. In fact, it's used every other page. So you use the, the heavily used one, then you use something else. And you use the heavily used one, you use something else. And so what happens is, you're walking your way through all the pages with the something else, but that heavy one keeps getting used. Eventually, it becomes the oldest page, and you throw it out, even though you, it's the, absolutely the last page you could possibly want to throw out, because it's the one you're using every other time. Hopefully, that answered the question. So another thing we might imagine is least recently used. Okay, Replace a page that hasn't been used for the longest time. Programs have locality, so if something's not used in a while, it's unlikely to use in the near future. So maybe LRU is a good approximation to min, uh, where we use the one that hasn't been used for the longest time, maybe that'll give us a good idea of the thing that's unlikely to be used furthest in the future. So how do you build LRU? Well, you build a list, right? So you, got, you put all the pages in a list, you have a head and a tail, and as a result, you can kind of figure out what the oldest page is. And on each use, you remove the page from a list and place it at the head. So the most recent one is here, and the LRU is the tail. And this sounds great. Is it great? Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, the, the comment that was on uh, the chat here is it seems slower. The answer is yes. The reason this is slow is remember that the, uh, you were trying to do really rapid uh, replacement policy. And um, the, the trouble here is that uh, we're doing a bunch of page manipulations uh, for every, every load and store to figure out which page is the most or the least recently used. So that means that we took something that we had gotten fast, the load and store, by building a TLB and building a cache, and we made it slower again because every access has to rearrange this uh, this list of all pages, and it has to do multiple uh, pointer manipulations. So this is definitely slower, okay? And so you need to know immediately when each page is used. You can change the position in the list, and this is just many instructions per instruction for load or store, and this is just not going to be what we want. So we clearly would like to at least figure out how to implement LRU, but this is currently not the way to do it. So. In practice, we approximate. So let's look at uh, FIFO straw man here. I want you to see, suppose we have three page frames, four virtual frames. And so notice that since we have four pages in our virtual address space, but three page frames, it's not possible for all of those four pages to be in uh, DRAM simultaneously. So I've set up a situation which is uh, you know, guaranteed to do some replacement. And now let's suppose we do, you know, A, B, C, A, B, D, A, D, B, C, B. There's our access pattern. And let's consider FIFO page replacement. So here is uh, page one, two, and three in the physical memory. And here's our reference. The first one we asked it for is A. And uh, one is our first uh, thing to replace. That's no problem. Then we asked for B. And so we're going to leave A in here because our next page to replace is B is number two. Uh, so we put B in number two. C, we put in number three, and now at this point, the FIFO policy has to start replacing pages. Uh, as soon as we need some, a new page, we're gonna replace A by FIFO policy. But fortunately, the next thing we want in this access up here is A. Oh, A is cached, so we don't have to replace anything. B, B is cached. C, oh, not C. Okay, now D comes up, we don't have D. So now we have to replace something. Well, in this case, because we're doing FIFO, it's A, it gets replaced, okay? Because the FIFO replacement, A is the oldest page. Now we come back to A and, oh, gee, A is not in memory. And so A has to be replaced. And now number two is our, uh, page two is our thing to replace. And so we put A here. And then we come back to D, you know, that's good. And we come back to B and, oh, B is missing. What do we replace now? Page three, okay? C comes back, ah, I gotta replace page one. B comes back, oh, that's cached, we're good to go. So FIFO in this uh, access pattern gives us seven faults. And when referencing D again, if you look right here, clearly replacing A was the wrong thing to do because A was the very next uh, thing that we wanted. So here, this is clearly a policy problem, a policy miss when we go to look for A and it's missed, all right? 
So now let's see if we can apply the same idea to uh, min. So suppose we have the same reference stream, but now what we're going to do is we're going to use an oracle and figure out to replace the page that's used the longest in the future or that's uh, needed the longest in the future. And so A, uh, we start out exactly the same way, okay, because there's nothing different here because there's nothing in page one, two, and three. But now everything's full. We come back to A, A is good. We come back to B, B is good. Now when we go to D, the question is, what do we do? And if we look in the future here, clearly C is the farthest one in the future that's going to be used. And so when we replace for D, we're going to replace C. Okay, and why C? Because we use this magic oracle that replaces for us the one farthest in the future that we need. And so now when we go to A and D, those are all fully cached. We get to B, that's fully cached. We get to C, at that point we have to do a replacement. And pretty much at that point we can replace anything because uh, there's not much of a future here, right? <laughs> and B is still uh, in memory. So the only thing uh, given this reference stream that would have been wrong is to replace B at this point. All right. So min has only five faults, whereas FIFO had seven. Uh, and what would LRU do? So it turns out that it's the same decision as min. So in this case, uh, if we had applied LRU to this pattern, we would have gotten the same uh, result. Okay, and that's really because um, at the point we go to replace D, you can see that A and B have been recently used, and so C is the least recently used, and so we would have gotten the same pattern. Not always the case, and in fact, here's a, a question. Suppose we have A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. I hope you can see this is going to be just bad for LRU. So look. Why? This is the worst problem. This is the worst possible case for LRU where uh, the working set of n plus 1 uh, on n frames, n plus 1 pages on n frames, or n, n plus 1 frames on n frames, basically gives us uh, a miss every time. OK, if you look at, look at them together, uh, when will LRU perform badly? You can see this example. And let's look at how min does much better here. So if you look, uh, if I work this out, min will actually uh, go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 faults to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So while LRU seems like it's a good approximation to min, LRU is not min. And there are some weird patterns in which uh, min does better. But of course, this is contrived. And if you're really walking through all of your memory um, and filling up a page, uh, pretty much you're in trouble. Okay. Um, now, what we'd like is a situation where if we are in trouble because we see that we don't have quite enough memory and we're page faulting enough, wouldn't it be nice if we could just add some more pages to, the, um, to that process and lower our uh, miss rate? So in this instance, up here, if we just added a fourth page to this process, then all of a sudden it would have no misses after the first four uh, compulsory misses, we would be good to go. In fact, if we had a prefetcher, maybe we fetch A and it fetches B, C, and D, and we have only one miss. But that's a that's a different uh, conversation for a little later. So the question is: This is a desirable property. You add memory, the miss rate drops. Is that always the case? It seems like it ought to be, right? It seems like I ought to be able to add more frames, and I'm good to go. And the answer is no. So there is a famous anomaly called Bilady's anomaly. And that's certain replacement algorithms like FIFO don't have the property that when you increase uh, and add memory to it, that you actually get a, a lower hit rate. Um, and uh, it's true. So adding memory does actually make LRU and min better, not for FIFO. And uh, there are some good examples you can show where I go from three pages Okay, with FIFO, that one I showed you earlier. Well, it's actually a little different because it's got E in here, but three pages with FIFO versus four pages with FIFO. And if you were to count this out, there's actually more misses with more pages down below. So uh, FIFO is not only bad because it throws out uh, uh, highly used, but uh, first referenced in the far past pages, but it also has the ladies anomaly. So the bottom line of this slide is just say no to using FIFO for a paging algorithm. Okay.
So let's talk a little bit about LRU before we finish up for the night. Um, so a perfect implementation of LRU might be we timestamp time every page on a reference somehow and keep a list of pages ordered by time. But um, this is also too expensive to implement for many reasons. So this and the linked list option I showed you earlier is not good. But what we can do is the clock algorithm. And the clock algorithm, which we'll go into, I guess we're not going to have enough time to go into it in depth today, but I just want to give you a little flavor for it, is we're going to arrange physical pages in a circle with a single clock hand, uh, approximating LRU, OK? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to take every physical page and put it into a, circ into a uh, linked list, OK? And we're just going to walk around. And we're going to replace an old page, not the oldest page. So the reason that the clock is going to work and not have this problem that we had with the linked list is uh, our, we're no longer interested in replacing the absolute oldest page, just an old page. OK? And the details are we're going to have, uh, in our page table entry, a use bit. And that hardware use bit basically gets set by the hardware every time a page is used, a mapped page. So when you have a, a page that is um, mapped properly and you do a loader store to it, what happens is the use bit, or the accessed bit, gets set. Okay, And what that says is, if the bit isn't set, the page hasn't been referenced in a while. Okay, And so on a page fault, all we do is we look at the next page in our ring, not in real time. We look at the next page in our ring, and we say, look, uh, check the use bit. If it's a 1, it's used recently, and so therefore this page is, is popular, somewhat popular. We'll clear that page and leave it alone. Otherwise, if it's 0, we're going to say, hey, this page could be replaced because it's not that popular and hasn't been used recently. Now, why do I mean used recently? Well, because we're, we're going to clock through every page in a circle, and uh, as uh, and as we go around, we set that bit to zero. And so a bit equal to zero when we look at it really says that it hasn't been used in the last cycle through all the pages. Okay. And the question might be, will we always find a page or are we going to loop forever? And the answer is that even if all of the use bits are set, uh, we're going to go through, we're going to set, um, set them to zero in a full loop, and then we'll get to use one on the next page. So here's a, a graphical version of this. So if you look, there's a single clock hand. Um, as we go around, we first look at the use bit. If the use bit is off, then we've got a page to replace. Otherwise, we set it off, and we keep walking around until we find a page that has the bit off. And um, what a bit that's off really says is that in the last loop, nobody's used it. Okay. Now, if the hand is moving really slowly, what this means is we're not looking for a lot of pages to replace, so that's good. OK, that's a good sign. OK, not many page faults, and uh, so we're good to go. If the hand is moving quickly, we know that there's lots of page faults, or we're having to go around many times to find a page. Um, and so uh, we're basically thrashing. OK, and so one way to view this clock algorithm is that it's uh, a crude partitioning of pages uh, into two groups, young and old pages. OK. Are there any questions on that? OK. You know, you may ask a question. So this is effectively partitioning pages into old and new pages, or old and, uh, and uh, recently touched pages into two groups. Why not more than two groups? So the question is, does this introduce a lot of overhead? Good question. So what is it? What is, uh, when do we run the clock algorithm? Well, the way I've described it to you, we only run the clock algorithm on a page fault where we already know that we're going to have to go to disk, and therefore it's going to be slow anyway. So the overhead of this algorithm is probably not particularly high relative to a million instructions worth of time. So that's one answer to your question. The second answer, though, is that in reality, this isn't quite what happens. What happens is we use the clock algorithm to fill up a, a linked list uh, when we're not busy page faulting, and, or excuse me, a, a free list, when we're not page faulting. And as a result, typically on a page fault, we go to the free list first, and we're only running this clock algorithm to keep the free list free. Okay.
Um, the last uh, thing, since we're uh, running virtual, I'm going to go for a few more minutes here. There's a version of the clock algorithm called the nth chance algorithm, which is basically give the page n chances. And so the operating system keeps the counter per page, uh, which is how many times have we gone around and looked at a given page. And on a page fault, the OS checks the use bit. If the use bit's a one, what do we know? We know the page is recently used. So in that case, we clear the use bit and the counter uh, because that's a, that's a frequently or a recently used page. If it's a zero, we know that page hasn't been used in the last cycle, but maybe it was used in a previous cycle and we don't want to just divide our pages into old and new. We want to do something a little closer to LRU. And so what we do in that case is we increment the counter associated with that page. And uh, if the count hits N, then we replace it. Okay, and this means that the clock hand basically has to sweep by N times without a page being used before it's replaced. And how do you pick N? Well, if you pick a really large N, you actually get a good approximation to LRU, but you have to go around many times before you decide a page is, is uh, really old. Um, a reason to do small N is it's more efficient. And uh, what about dirty pages in this instance? What often happens is because a dirty page can't be immediately reused, what people do is for a dirty page, you let N be a little bigger and you start a dirty page out to disk when you first notice it and then uh, let you go around a couple of times. And so a common approach might actually be for N pages with set N equal, or for dirty, uh, excuse me, for clean pages, we set N to one. And for dirty pages, we set N to two. Um, and uh, this is the nth chance version of the clock algorithm. So I wanna free you guys up. So in conclusion, we started talking about replacement policies, which are uh, how, do, how do we get by those policy misses? And so the replacement policies are, for instance, FIPO uh, that we talked about, place pages on queue and replace the page at the end of the queue. So that's uh, replace old pages, um, not well-used pages. We talked about min, which is to replace the page that we'll use farthest in the future. That's a guaranteed not to ex uh, exceed Oracle that we'd like to approximate. And our best approximation we've come up with so far is LRU, which is replace a page that's used farthest in the past. The problem is that LRU can't be done easily, and so we started talking about the clock algorithm, which is an approximation to LRU. And just to repeat that, you take all of the pages, you put them in a circular list, you sweep through them, marking them as not in use as you go around. And if a page isn't in use uh, for one or more passes, then you know that it's an old page and maybe it's replaceable. And we started now talking about the nth chance algorithm, where we let a page uh, be not in use for a few more loops to let it uh, age a little longer before we throw it out. Um, and uh, next time we're actually going to talk about some interesting variants like the second chance